Ready to break free from algorithms, vanity PR, and money-sucking ads? My name's Larissa Worstiak, and I've learned in seven years of jewelry marketing that content is the crown jewel. My agency, Joy Joya, takes a holistic approach, leading with laser-focused storytelling, impactful content creation, and strategic content distribution. This method has worked for the solopreneur as well as the multi-million dollar company, and now I'm sharing these systems and tactics with you. Here's to standing out in the sea of sparkle. This is episode 232, and today I'll be helping you set specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based goals to guide the creation of all your marketing content. By the end of listening or watching, you'll know exactly what you want your content to achieve, whether that's one objective or multiple objectives, and then use this newfound clarity to your advantage. You'll want every piece of content you put out into the world to be goal driven. The difference between someone who creates content for content's sake versus a business owner or team using content to boost their marketing is one simple thing. The business owner or the team has a very specific goal in mind. I'll be covering what should a good goal include, What are some of the types of goals you can set for your marketing content? How can you choose the best goals? And it has to do with your customer personas. I told you they were important. And how to start brainstorming ways to use content in service of your goals. From now through early July, I'm offering a free yes, free six month podcast guided program called Jewelry Marketing Jumpstart, which involves weekly audio and video lessons just like this one, as well as companion PDF downloads for each episode. If you wanna sign up for free right now without delay and get the companion PDF download for this episode, visit joyjoya.com slash jump and you'll find that link in the show notes. But before we get to the solid gold, I'd like to take a moment to remind you that this podcast has both audio and video, so you can either listen on your favorite podcast platform or watch on YouTube by searching Joy Joya. You can support the podcast for free by taking the time not only to subscribe, but also to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. And if you leave a review, I might read it on a future episode. So please let me know what you think about this one or about any other major takeaways you've had recently. Speaking of podcasts, did you know I also co-host another podcast with jewelry marketer Liz Kantner? It's called Success with Jewelry, and we already have more than 25 free episodes up there. I've lost count. You can listen anywhere you listen to podcasts as well as find Success with Jewelry on YouTube. We also have an insider community where we share extended episodes, hands-on guidance, and a plethora of resources. Visit successwithjewelry.com to learn more. Okay, my sparklers, let's get into the next installment of Jewelry Marketing Jumpstart all about setting goals for your marketing content. Again, you can visit joyjoya.com slash jump for the companion PDF to this episode. Hey, it's free, so why not? So let's address the first question. What should a quote unquote good goal include? So I've definitely talked about this before and I also have a section in my book, Jewelry Marketing Joy about it but you wanna think about the acronym SMART. If this is repetitive for you and it might be, that's okay. I think it's important to have a refresher every now and then because I know I personally forget about what an effective goal should include. I think it's so easy to lose sight of it and to kind of think more generally about your business. So SMART stands for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based. So let me quickly run through what 
all five of those words mean if this is new to you. So specific means, and this is probably the most important of the five, it means that it's not vague. Okay, I realize that's the opposite of specific, but I think so many entrepreneurs, small business owners, they're like, well, I just want to be successful or I want to grow my business. But what does that actually mean? Like if you had to put a one sentence definition on what success actually means to you, how would you describe it? I want you to be more specific than you even think you have to be, because if you don't know what you're moving toward, there's no way to know what the path is to get there. And I think people are afraid to be specific because they meet, it means to them that they're opening themselves up to the possibility of failure. Because once you commit to something, there's a possibility maybe it won't come true. But the opposite of that is achieving your wildest dreams and even beyond that. So you have to be super specific. Next, you have to make your goal measurable because how will you know that you reached your goal or you won't be able to really stop and appreciate the fact that you've achieved it if you don't have like a number or some kind of standard around what that goal means, whether it's a revenue goal or an email subscriber goal or a conversion rate goal, whatever it is, it needs to be measurable, attainable. So yes, I totally want you to set those like pie in the sky dreams. I've heard it called also BHAG, the big, hairy, audacious goals. You want to be thinking big, but you also don't want to like right out the gate set yourself up for (laughs) failure because it's just not feasible on any level. So make it something that you can achieve, especially if you're just starting out with goal setting. You want to give yourself some quick wins to build your confidence. You want your goal also to be relevant. So what that means, it seems like it's obvious, right? But you want to think about the state, the stage of your business. So if you're a total startup, your goal should not be related to like sales conversions or something like that because from the beginning, you're going to be focused on brand awareness and just getting eyeballs on the brand. So you have to think about what is actually relevant to where you are in your business. And lastly, time-based. So time-based, I think, works hand-in-hand with measurable. You need to put a deadline on your goal so that you can work back for, backwards from there and set up the steps it's going to take to help you get from point A to point B in six months, in a year, in five years. If you don't know the end that you're working toward, you're never going to understand what it's going to take to get to that end. So now that you know very well what makes a good goal for your business, you're probably curious about what are some types of goals that you can be setting for your content. So I'll share just a few examples of these types of goals. And then for each one, give a quick model off the top of my head of how you can turn it into a SMART goal so that you have some examples to work from as you're going through this process yourself. So If you are focused on right now, for example, fostering brand loyalty or repeat customers, so to get people to come back to you instead of always worrying about acquiring new customers, your goal could be within six months, I want to make 25% of my current customers, repeat customers, and getting them to come back and make a purchase of at least whatever your average price point, $1,000. So an example of content that you can create in service of that goal would be, okay, let's say you're a wedding jewelry business and you are hoping to get those customers who purchase their engagement rings with you, who purchase their wedding bands with you to come back and buy more. And so they don't just stop the shopping journey there. You can perhaps provide 
educational content about building a jewelry collection after the engagement ring and wedding band, or you can have blog posts or like a downloadable PDF style guide about building like a wedding stack with anniversary bands or whatever, styling your wedding stack or even jewelry to wear on the wedding day if they've purchased some stuff before the actual wedding. So it's all about kind of anticipating the customer's next move and what they're going to need and then designing content in service of the goal that you have. So let's say another like general desire that you have is gaining more traffic to your website um, via organic search. So because you've optimized your website, you get more people to come to the website. So to make that a smart goal, you could say something like, by the, by the end of this year, I want to increase organic traffic to the website by 20%. And then an example of content types that can help you achieve that is to make sure you are seeking search keywords that your target audience may be using to find things on Google and then making an assertive effort to incorporate those keywords into your content, whether that's in your blog posts, on your product pages, in your meta descriptions. And if that all sounds foreign to you right now, don't worry. There will be more on SEO to come in future episodes, but I'm just kind of like warming you up to the idea of this. So let's say another general goal is you want to close more sales or increase your conversion rate. And that's really going to mean educating your prospects because maybe you have a higher priced product and your customers really need a lot of nurturing to get from awareness to purchase. And it's actually a proven fact in e-commerce research that the higher your price point, the more information and trust factors you will need on a product page to make someone feel comfortable buying. Of course, this doesn't necessarily apply to well-known prestige brands because they can coast by on their reputation and their desirability. It sucks for the little people out there, but it just means that you have an opportunity to kind of take that market share by educating customers, sharing your brand story, sharing what makes you unique. So maybe the specific goal is by the end of this year, I wanna increase my conversion rate by, I don't know, two and a half percent or something like that. And to do that, you can use content on your product pages, in your abandoned cart emails, and on other website pages to really provide that customer the value that they desire. So let's say you have a general desire to attract customers from a specific demographic. So maybe it doesn't seem like the people who are visiting your website or interacting with your social media profiles are the people who represent your target audience. They don't seem like the people you wanna be targeting and therefore they're not buying anything. This is a sign it's time to adjust the content, maybe even revisit the brand voice, the brand story, to make sure it's actually resonating with the people that you want to be resonating with. And that specific goal could be something like by, the end of this year, I want to achieve penetration of a specific demographic, like ages 40 to 50, if that's what you're targeting. And I want to increase that by 20%. And those are things you can monitor by looking at the analytics in Google Analytics or your social media data to kind of see like who's actually looking at my stuff. Maybe you want to get more engagement on your e-commerce site. So you're a newer brand. You notice people aren't really spending time on the site. They kind of just go and then leave. 
That's annoying because they're not going to make a purchase if they're not spending time learning about you and exploring your products. So the specific goal could be by six months, I want to reduce my bounce rate by 20%. And bounce rate, just side note, in Google Analytics means the percentage of people who visit your site and immediately leave. So having a high bounce rate is a sign that people are not engaging with your site. So you can use your content to give visitors more reasons to stay on your site by making it fun and interactive and engaging. Let's say another goal is to grow your newsletter list, which I know that a lot of people listening to this, that is definitely something that you're working on. So your specific goal might be by the end of this quarter, I wanna add a thousand new subscribers to my email newsletter list, engaged and qualified subscribers. So content can be of service of that by maybe in exchange for their email address, you promise like a downloadable style guide or a guide to the gemstones that you use or a guide to choosing the perfect engagement ring. So content can be like the currency in this case and be the incentive for someone to choose to give them your email address. And then lastly, let's say your general general goal is brand awareness. This is especially relevant for new brands, but brands really at every stage of growth always need to be working on brand awareness because they always need to be like communicating their story, attracting new customers. So this is relevant to any business at any size. This is a little bit of a tough example for goal setting and specificity and measurability. I don't even know if that's a word. Brand awareness is notoriously difficult to measure even for the most seasonal mark seasoned marketer because as you can imagine there's a lot of like abstractness around it like how can you measure that people are paying attention to you there are definitely metrics that you can choose but there's a little bit of an uncertainty around it anyway let's say you want more people to learn about your brand or build trust with it you're new to the marketplace. If this is your goal, you can use content in service of their of this goal. So you want to prioritize authenticity, transparency, telling a story, and you want your content to kind of like really make noise in the marketplace. It has to stand out from the overwhelming din of everything else out there. And you want to make that content shareable, cross promote it with aligned brand partners, be the voice or face of the brand, be at events, try something different and new to get noticed. All right, now that you have heard some examples of goals and how you can use content in service of those goals, You may be feeling a little bit overwhelmed and wondering, how do I choose the best goals for my business? Big hint, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this episode, it does have a lot to do with your customer personas. I told you they were important. I hope you believed me. That's back a few episodes where you really need to dive into your customer personas because in order to answer this question and pretty much every question I'll be asking you about your business, you need to come from a place of knowing your customers. So if you haven't done that, don't think you can skip ahead and be successful with these tasks. You have to do that work, unfortunately. I hate to to break it to you. So. This might also be a little bit obvious, but choosing the best goal also depends on where you are right now at this moment in your business, as well as what you hope to achieve in your business and what like your resources are. Because if you're a one person show and you're just like a startup right now, 
it's not going to be realistic to say you're going to be a multi-million dollar company in six months without the resources it's really going to take to get there. So you have to be kind of humble. You have to be realistic, but it's also great to be ambitious in your thoughts and to think big at the same time. If you're just starting out or you're starting or you've been in business and you're starting to be more serious about marketing, then maybe you just want to focus on the brand awareness part of it or about growing your email list because When you're starting out, you're not going to have enough traction, enough data, enough traffic to be at the stage where you're like optimizing your e-commerce website for sales. That is skipping a lot of steps. If you've been in business for a while and you have a reliable source or multiple sources of traffic to your online store, then it's time to take it to the next level find out where are people dropping off in the shopping journey, what are their most common objections, why don't they purchase? Again, that goes back to knowing your customer. So not only will you have to know your customer, but you're going to need to assess where you are. You're also going to need to focus on just one or two goals before you move to the next one. Otherwise, you'll be way too scattered and won't really be able to tell what's working and not working. But when you have a really established business and you've nailed the foundation of your marketing and you're trying to scale, you're trying to take things to the next level, ideally all the marketing should be working like a well-oiled machine and you're going to need to have content, not just for the brand awareness, not just for the sales conversions, but content for all parts of the customer journey so that all the parts can work together and cater to every kind of customer and their needs. So there will always be a need for brand awareness. You need to have content for that. You'll be wanting to make sure your website is engaging with past customers, so you'll need to have content for that. You'll need to have content for people who are just about ready to buy and need a little push. And all that content will be doing different things because the customer who just learns about your brand for the first time is not going to need the same thing as a customer who already loves, loves, loves your brand and just has one small hesitation. Or maybe the customer who's purchased from you already but kind of just forgot that you exist And really, they would love something new, but you have to like remind them of what it is that inspired them to buy in the first place. So knowing your customer, what is the customer behavior or stage of the shopping journey that you're trying to cater or appeal to? And once you know your customers inside and out, what motivates them, what attracts them, what turns them off? then you will be able to create content for and set goals for your customer for exactly where they are in their buying journey. And they will feel so seen and so understood by you that they will become customers for life. So how can you start brainstorming ways to use content in service of your goals based on where you are and what you wanna achieve? So again, think of your stage of business, what you wanna be focusing on, what do you wanna kind of like correct for, where is the customer not resonating with you or like losing attention or going to a competitor? In the last episode, we talked about all types of content. So here's a recap of how they can potentially work to serve your customer at different stages. So blog posts could be used for any type of customer at any stage of the journey, but maybe where you decide to share the blog post is different. So for example, maybe you have a link to a blog post in your abandoned cart email about a profile that you've done of a past customer to give that person the social proof they need. So another type of content, educational materials that you share with clients. Maybe someone has scheduled a custom jewelry consultation with you to design their dream engagement ring, but they're still shopping around. 
So you can share a piece of educational content that explains what really differentiates your process, your materials, your designs, your customer interactions from the rest. Another type of content would be storytelling on product pages or in your product descriptions. So as I said before, that high ticket client needs to feel like they're getting a luxury experience and they will want all the info, whether they read it or not, they are going to want to feel taken care of and catered to. Another type of content would be gift guides or other free downloads or PDFs. These are great for customers who are casual or occasional shoppers of your brand, or maybe even those who follow you but haven't purchased before, depending on how you use or share them, but they can ultimately serve as inspiration. Direct mail marketing, another type of content. These are great. Direct mail marketing campaigns are great to increase brand awareness, or they can engage with lapsed customers and try to reach them in a new way and break out from the noise of email marketing. Video and audio content, great for brand awareness. Quizzes and other interactive content can inspire someone to start shopping if they've just found you to spend more time on your site and to engage with your brand in a meaningful way. So can you see all the possibilities of content and how it can engage people at various stages at different parts of their discovery, browsing, and shopping journeys? That's it for now. Much more to come in future episodes. Go to joyjoya.com jump for additional information action items, and exercises related to this episode. Before we get into the gold mine, as well as my news roundup, I want to share how I'd apply the lesson I just discussed to a jewelry brand in the wild. So I've been sharing brands that aren't my clients that I'm just kind of like speculating on, but this brand that I'm going to be talking about actually is a client, and I thought they were just the perfect example of this. So I've been working with them since 2019, specifically on their content. Atta Pearl is a jewelry brand that sells one primary product, and that is customized pearl necklaces that are typically bought as keepsakes for children. So they're bought a lot by moms, aunts, grandmas, dads, like family members to give as meaningful gifts for a child's birthday or for the holidays or for like religious holidays. So the customer can buy a starter necklace with one pearl as the first gift. And then for every life milestone, upcoming birthday or holiday, they can buy additional pearls, send them back to add a pearl, and they kind of restring and build the necklace as the child grows up. So it becomes this like heirloom gift. You can imagine that a company like this has customers with very different needs all at the same time. Some are searching for a lovely keepsake gift but don't yet know about Add a Pearl. Some are maybe aware of Add a Pearl but are nervous about investing in such a gift that will require maintenance and more money spent over time. Or maybe it's a customer who's never bought jewelry or pearls before, so they need a little bit of hand-holding or more information. And then some are current customers, and maybe they need more information about the process of adding pearls to the necklace, or they need those reminders to keep adding to the necklace because I think it's super easy to forget that there's this option that they can easily gift their loved ones. So it's a whole range of needs and we have developed content to cater to every single type of stage in the journey. For the brand awareness stage, as well as for people who are on the fence about making a purchase, we have a huge library of blog posts that have been thoughtfully and strategically curated. Many of them are ranking number one in Google for keywords like meaningful baby gifts, giving a pearl necklace, and more. We're also ranking for other keywords that would establish Add a Pearl as an expert in the field. 
So even if people aren't necessarily searching for a gift at the moment, maybe they're curious about pearls. And then as a result of their search, they learn that add a pearl is even a thing that exists. So those would be keywords like how to clean cultured pearls, pearl types, and more. For the people who have already found the brand or have heard about it or were were referred to it by a friend or family member and they need more of a push to complete the purchase and just go for it, we have a whole library of very touching, like pull on your heartstrings, meaningful customer stories from real customers who have these truly amazing and inspiring stories to share about how they have like incorporated the tradition of this necklace into their lives. We also have details about how the process work works, how the necklaces are made, all the information about pearls you could ever want or need if you're nervous about pearl value or doubtful that you'd be making the right decision by completing the purchase. And then there's also reminder content that gets sent to past customers, as well as those customer stories too, to keep the people who have purchased as inspired by the product as the day they first decided to buy the necklace. Because as we all know, people get distracted over time. They forget why they chose to do something in the first place. They forget the meaning behind it. They start to feel detached from it. So we're really thinking about customers at every stage of the process with the content. And it's really amazing how much richness this has infused into the brand overall. What do you think? Could you also imagine how you can cater to the needs of a customer at every stage? I would love to know. Let me know in the comments or in a DM. Okay, let's get into the gold mine. If you've been following this podcast, you know that I launched the gold mine in August as a secondary episode every week, but now it's part of the main episode and it's more of like a personal, more intimate take from me. So today's gold mine is kind of a pep talk I'd like to share in response to some recent laments, frustrations. I've heard from jewelry entrepreneurs just like you. So let me know in the comments on YouTube or in a DM on Instagram if you feel like I'm speaking to you because I hope it resonates. So you're not doing anything wrong and you're not missing the wonder pill or like the magic solution you know all the boxes you are supposed to be checking in your business because I know you've heard them all before. You've read the books, you've listened to the podcasts, you've watched the YouTube videos, you've followed other people who talk about this stuff. You're doing a good job. Sure, you're not perfect, but who is? I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, no one's perfect. You're super committed to your business and you have big dreams. And I know that you're wondering, what's the one thing I'm missing? What am I not seeing? Where is my blind spot? You've asked things like, is posting more reels the answer? Is showing my face on video the answer? Why do I see other brands finding success doing the actual opposite of what the experts are recommending that I do? What is different about them and how come they get to do that? Like I said, you're actually not doing the wrong things and you're not going to find the cure all. But the one blind spot that you do have is that you're not asking the right questions. You're smart, I know it. So when you can't see the way forward, it's not because you can't figure something out or because you're not doing the required work. You're actually looking for answers to questions you haven't asked. And you're too preoccupied with the answers without actually having the questions. Instead of asking, how often should I be posting on Instagram? Ask, 
where's the opportunity on Instagram? Or is Instagram not even the opportunity? Instead of asking, how many emails should I be sending? Ask, how often do my customers want to hear from me? And what's it going to take to get them engaged and taking the actions I want them to take? Otherwise, you're just wondering how many boxes you're going to have to check on that marketing checklist in the sky. And I can promise you, no business owner who ever found success and achieved their dreams got there by checking boxes. Start instead by asking, what's the long-term goal and what am I or we hoping to achieve? And then work backwards from there rather than from this small place that you're keeping yourself in. What should we do is a question I hear so much. Well, the answer to that is you need to do whatever it takes to help you achieve the goal and you need to start with the goal. And you need to know that goal first before you can do whatever it takes. So if you wanna continue doing the exact same thing that you're doing now and that you've been doing, then you're going to be working harder and not smarter. Like, and you are a smart person, so let's step into that identity of yours And you're going to continue checking the same boxes while the marketplace and the marketing landscape around you gets more and more and more crowded and complex and confusing. Tell me in a YouTube comment or podcast review if you can relate to this. Do you feel inspired by it? Do you feel challenged by it? And when was the last time you asked yourself some really hard questions about your goals. Okay, let's get into the news roundup where I share three relevant articles related to jewelry or marketing, and you can find the links in the show notes. So the first article comes from CBC, a Canadian publication, but I've seen this kind of around in the world. And the article is called No More Clumpy Lip Gloss, How TikTok's De-Influencing Trend Became a Marketing Tactic. So this article is talking about this new TikTok trend, and I guess a more general trend in influencer marketing called de-influencing, which describes the rejection of viral cult favorite products and influencers in favor of more affordable or like realistic choices. So... You've probably seen influencers like talking up a product that's maybe like way too expensive, like who could afford that? Or you can tell they don't really believe in the product, they're just getting paid for it. So these de-influencers are being more authentic and real about the products that they're talking about. So with the cost of living going up, creators are striving to build trust with audiences who can't afford expensive products that some influencers influencers are paid up to half a million dollars to promote. And this is mostly limited to the beauty and style verticals is where I've been seeing it. But I think it's gonna start extending beyond that. I think especially Gen Z, this is a true value that they have. And I think you, you'll you be seeing it more and more, especially on TikTok. So they're using this tactic to build credibility and trust by recommending alternatives that they think will give their followers high quality experiences. And the trend is only growing with the de-influencing hashtag on TikTok accruing more than 228 million views to date. So my main takeaway is look at de-influencing, especially if it comes specifically to the jewelry vertical, but you know, even seeing what these de-influencers are saying about apparel, fashion, beauty, look at it as honest customer feedback or like target audience feedback in a way to gain information 
about who is out there. Like, who are these people who will and won't buy from you? Especially if you serve millennials and Gen Z. Go use that feedback to do research about what they like, what they don't like. Even if it's not specifically related to jewelry, but more broad, like fashion and lifestyle, and then ultimately become better acquainted with your target audience. The next article comes from Modern Retail, and it's called Why Retailers and Platforms Are Rushing to Incorporate AI and ChatGPT into Online Shopping. So some online retailers are definitely looking for ways to incorporate these technologies into the shopping experience. While most of these e-commerce companies who are looking into chat GPT are larger tech-driven corporations, there are definitely startups, like they mentioned this one knife brand called Mycin, that are leveraging the tool in their marketing campaigns. And some analysts are predicting that AI will enhance the shopping experience by learning more about the customer's needs as they're shopping and then giving more personalized recommendations, which in a lot of ways is kind of great. It's creepy in some ways, but if it can make your shopping experience more efficient, um, I think that's a positive thing. So Nirish Parsad, practice lead for emerging tech at Tinuiti, noted that conversational element is what makes ChatGPT so exciting. He says ChatGPT could be used as an on-site personal shopper for those who have an expansive e-commerce experience. And now your personalization personalization experience gets more thought out. ChatGPT can remember conversations and context. So it gets to know a person and their experience both on site in its ongoing messaging. This person is really excited to see where that goes because we just don't have that technology today. If you buy things online, I mean, I don't know what your experience is like, but I have a really frustrating time finding the things that I'm looking for. And I would love a solution that kind of streamlines my shopping experience so I can waste less time on e-commerce sites and actually find the things that would delight me. So my main takeaway is, as these technologies get more and more advanced very quickly, I think it's a good time to at least have a vision of how you'd like your customers to shop your e-commerce website. What would be the ideal shopping experience? How could you help your customers find, help them find what they want to see? I think it's a great idea to start thinking really big because within only a matter of time, the tools will help you implement your online shopping experience dream. They will be available to you and customers will start to expect and demand those things. And then the last article comes from Forbes and it's called 14 ways for marketing teams to get customers engaged with a fun competition. Who doesn't love a bit of competition? If you're hoping to engage your customers in new ways, then you may want to inspire a little bit of competitive spirit in them. So some ideas would be creating a scavenger hunt on your e-commerce website where maybe you like hide a discount or a special product, create a digital game or task that enlists them to share user-generated content, maybe something that will help you create with them a new product or a new version of a product or a branded hashtag challenge where the customers have to post something unique on Instagram or TikTok using your hashtag. Doesn't necessarily have to be them wearing your jewelry, but kind of gets people engaged in, in the conversation. My main takeaway is looking for new ways to engage your target audience is key and a competition is something that inspires people to take action especially if the reward or prize is compelling did you have any questions about jewelry marketing jumpstart you can always email me larissa at l-a-r-y-s-s-a at joyjoya.com if you love this podcast Please share it with a friend who'd appreciate it. And don't forget to subscribe as well as leave a review on Apple Podcasts. If you're completely new to digital marketing for jewelry, then you'll want to purchase and read a copy of my book, Jewelry Marketing Joy. Visit joyjoya.com book for more information.